Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi and good day to everyone. In this video presentation, we will discuss insolvency specifically for companies. For that, we will be highlighting the two new rescue mechanisms since Company Act 2016. I would like to also make a note that there are a few articles shared under this topic that should enable you to understand insolvency and the new rescue mechanisms in Malaysia. Mo Chiu Yin, the head of insolvency and forensic at BDO Binder Malaysia, observes that terms like insolvency and restructuring are frequently used alongside bankruptcy and termination. But despite its negative connotations, these activities happen not only during bad times, but also in good times. To help us with the discussion, the flow of this video presentation will be as follows. We will first discuss the Bankruptcy Act that has been replaced by Insolvency Act in 2016, enacted in 2017, which is for individuals. This will bring us to the discussions of winding up and liquidation, since our focus is company instead of individual. We will then look at the two rescue mechanisms introduced by Company Act 2016, the Corporate Voluntary Arrangement and judicial management. Now let me remind you that I, in no way an expert in these legal issues, thus eventually if you are interested to know further, you can always find the answers to your questions in many reliable sources online and offline. Having said that, we need to discuss this to understand why certain companies choose this route and how they do it before we analyze the valuations of businesses as well as the accounting for insolvency and restructuring. To start this conversation about Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act, let us talk about Bursa Malaysia back in 2004, when it first changed its name from Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange. Now, Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange has quite a long history, going further back to 1930 but you can read the history yourself. There were two main boards. There was the main board, which it started with, and there was the second board that was launched in 1988 to enable smaller companies which were viable and have strong growth potential to be listed. And then there was MESDAC, the Malaysian Exchange for Securities Dealings and Automated Quotation, which was approved as a separate stock exchange in 1997, but it was not growing and therefore it was relaunched as MESDAC market on the Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange in 2002. This was a strategic position to enhance its capability as an efficient, cost-effective and competitive capital generating mechanism for technology and high growth companies. Now each market listed companies with different characteristics, mainly based on the total amounts of outstanding shares apart from other requirements. Apparently, the amount of shares that you have outstanding is related to the value of your company. At least that was what the market were portraying to the public. The higher the number and value of shares, the more successful your company is portrayed to be. And then we face the financial crisis. Companies were becoming insolvent. In 2009, a new board structure comprising the main and ACE markets was officially implemented. Basically, the main and second board were merged to form the main market, while the MESDAC market was revamped into an alternative market known as ACE market, which stands for Access, Certainty and Efficiency. What also changed was the requirements for listing. Let me show you what has been cancelled or taken out. For your information, you can check all amendments of the regulations and requirements in Bursa Malaysia website. Let us look at the amendments made in 2009 when the new board structure was implemented. As you can see here, 
the total amounts of shares issued as a requirement to be listed in these markets has been cancelled. We have come to realize that what more important is solvency and not the total amounts of shares outstanding since being solvent could almost guarantee our survival if something bad happened to the market. From here, companies are assessed on its level of operations and when Companies Act 2016 was enacted, solvency declaration also plays important role in continuing listing requirements. In 2017, the Leading Entrepreneur Accelerator Platform, Leap Market, an alternative platform for SMEs to raise capital, was launched. This has given the opportunity for SMEs to raise more capital from the public. However, to be listed, a company must apply through an approved advisor, which must be a corporate finance advisor registered with Security Commission and it must assess the company's suitability for listing. You may look into this further in Bursa Malaysia website. Another relevant development is the Modernizations of Companies Act 1965, initiated in early 2004 and enacted in 2016. There are quite few significant changes with the new Act. A couple of them are relevant to our discussion here. First, there is a requirement for companies to provide solvency statement. This is in line with the current market condition where being solvent is the key to survival, which also in line with the abolishments of the requirements on total amounts of shares issued as part of listing requirements. Also, the statement need to be signed by directors if the company undertakes activities that will reduce the cash of the company, such as declaring dividends to shareholders, reducing capital, giving or undertaking financial assistance, redeeming redeemable preference shares, as well as buying back companies' own shares. Another relevant change is the introductions of rescue mechanisms that have been used worldwide, Corporate Voluntary Arrangement, CVA, and Judicial Management, JM. Both are with the objective to assist financially distressed firms in restructuring their debts and ultimately help them stay afloat and continue as a going concern. We will talk further on these two rescue mechanisms later. Let us now consider this. Say that as an adult we have debt, maybe from high purchase of vehicles and house. When we fall short of money, we are not able to meet our obligations. We cannot pay the amounts required. We do have money, but it is just not enough. This is when we are deemed insolvent, not enough money to pay our debts. Then, if we did not take any actions to curb the issues that led us to becoming insolvent, we might fall into default. This is simply means that we are unable to make agreed upon payment at agreed upon time. We started to delay payments month after month and accumulate more interest. The worst of it is when we had to be declared bankrupt, where it is a legal declaration that we can no longer pay a debt. While we are at it, I just want to draw your attention to the sources of bankruptcy for individual that is. In 2016, it was reported that almost 65,000 Malaysian youth declared bankrupt since 2013 up to 2016. The ages also become younger, 18 years of age. From the survey, the main source of bankruptcy was known to be higher purchase loans, and in another report, credit cards were also another source of bankruptcy, especially among the youngsters, those who have just come into the workforce. For your information, by end of December last year, the total number of bankrupt individuals has reached more than 299,000. Between 2015 and 2019, there are more than 84,000 cases filed, within which 486 cases are those below 25 years, and 51,239 cases are those between 25 and 44 years of age. And more than 27,000 
cases were caused by personal loans. That is 32% of the overall cases. And if you look at this statistic by MDI, the Malaysian Department of Insolvency, only around 10% is caused by business loan. Now compare that to company liquidation and winding up between 2009 and 2019. There are around 42,400 cases. This is something that you need to be mindful of when you enter the workforce. The alarming increase in the number of bankrupts has catched the intentions of the government of the day and it intended to amend the Act to provide greater protection for debtors. Its principal objectives in seeking to do so are to reduce the number of bankruptcy cases to provide an opportunity for a debtor to rearrange his debts, to reduce the period before a bankrupt may be discharged from his bankruptcy, and to increase the minimum threshold for the presentations of a bankruptcy petition. You may ask, why would anyone want to apply for bankruptcy? Basically, what you are given is time and some sort of protection from being sued for not paying your debt. Mainly, you will be given a certain number of days, known as X days day, but within this period, you cannot be sued or creditors could not make any claim on your possession unless they are secured creditors. Some may even see it as erasing their debt by declaring bankrupt. Bankruptcy can be filed to the court by debtors or the creditors. If it was the creditors who petitioned for your bankruptcy, at times you will not even know it, as they are not required to ensure that the paper reach you. Your creditors might not have your current address, for example. And if your debt was guaranteed by someone else, that person will also be included in the petition, so you will drag your guarantor as well. But if it means that one can get away from paying his or her debt, some may be happy to be bankrupt. Well, if you were declared bankrupt, yes, you may be safe from having to pay the loan as long as your status is bankrupt, but you will also be losing few important things. Your personal assets will be taken away to be liquidated to pay some, if not all, of the debt. You are not allowed to travel outside the country. You will have limited credit line. Nobody would want to provide financial assistance to a bankrupt individual. Your status will be in the system. You cannot be employed as professionals such as lawyer and accountant. And you will have restrictions in business activities. You can no longer be a director of a company, or a business owner, or a business partner. As mentioned earlier, looking at the severity of the consequence of a bankrupt status, as well as the increasing number of bankrupts, the Insolvency Act 1967 was first tabled in Dewan Rakyat in November 2016 and came into operation in 2017. These are some of the main changes of the Bankruptcy Act 1967. Five of these will make it more difficult for an individual to be declared bankrupt. Note that the name of the Act might cause a slight confusion to some as this Act is for individuals, while the Companies Act 2016 uses the term insolvency practitioner to describe a liquidator of a company. Out of the highlighted five, the rescue mechanism, which is the voluntary arrangement, will be somewhat similar to the rescue mechanisms introduced in Companies Act 2016 for companies. This provision under Section 2C1, Insolvency Act 1967, allows individuals to make arrangements to stop them from being a bankrupt before it happens. This is an arrangement taken before any bankruptcy papers serviced by creditors, a measure where individuals who find themselves so deep in debt can propose to their creditors a debt payment plan through a nominee and it must be approved by the creditors within 90 days interim order. This arrangement gives more freedom to debtors to dictate terms of their repayment and perhaps prevent bankruptcy. 
and remember being bankrupt without you knowing? That will no longer happen since stricter requirements are imposed for the service of bankruptcy papers. Anyone who petitions for your bankruptcy must make sure that you get the paper so that you can take necessary actions. So if you find yourself or your company in financial difficulties, you might end up declaring bankrupt. And for companies, you might end up winding up or liquidate your companies. But if you realize that you or your companies are in financial troubles at the early stage, has become insolvent and want to avoid bankruptcy, if you are individuals, talk to the professionals like AKPK or apply for the voluntary arrangement. And if you are companies, you may go for rescue mechanisms for companies, which will be further discussed in a bit. Before we proceed, let us look at a few terms. First, insolvent. Insolvent is incapability of a company to meet financial obligations, in which this can be viewed in the statement of company's financial position. Default, a situation where a company is unable to make agreed upon payment to creditors on agreed upon time. Bankrupt, a legal procedure filed by debtors where debtors declared that he can no longer pay the creditors back and creditors work with the authority to recover whatever they can in which company need to produce the statement of company's legal position. Secured creditors are banks or other asset-based lenders that holds a fixed or floating charge of a business asset or assets. Thus, the unsecured creditors will be those individuals or institutions that lend money without obtaining specific assets as collateral. This possess a high risk to the creditor because it will have nothing to fall back on should the borrower default on the loan. This is important as some requirements under the rescue mechanisms will need the approval of specific group of creditors. Arrangements include reorganizations of shares and include arrangements for insolvent and solvent companies. Reconstruction or restructuring will include amalgamations of companies. Receiver is a person or a company appointed by a secured creditors when a default occurs under its security. Receivership is a process in which a legally appointed receiver acts as custodians of a company's assets or business operation, that is for liquidations or restructuring. And a liquidator includes official receiver responsible to liquidate a corporation. For winding up or liquidation of companies, there are basically three ways of how it can happen. Members voluntary liquidation, creditors voluntary liquidations, and court liquidation. The first way of liquidation is members voluntary liquidation. This liquidation is basically applied by a solvent company that choose to cease operations voluntarily while able to pay off its debts in full within 12 months of its winding up. This usually happens when a company has stopped its operation or has achieved and completed its objective. Sometimes, this can also be the result of disagreement among shareholders that they agreed to wind up the company. Second, the creditors' voluntary liquidation. This happens when directors of a company believe that the company is unable to continue its business due to its liabilities and initiate a creditor's voluntary liquidation by making the necessary declaration, appointing the provisional liquidator and resolving to wind up the company. 
This is done voluntarily and after assessing all possibilities of remaining going concern. And the third way of liquidation is the court liquidation. This liquidation by court could come about due to various circumstances such as company is unable to pay its debts, directors having acted in their own interests, oppressions of minority shareholders, suspensions of business by company, regulatory non-compliance, and company's banking or insurance license having been revoked. For details, provisions on winding up and liquidation, we can refer to Part 4 of the Act. Part 3 of the Companies Act talks about the management of company, including insolvency, receivership and risk construction. As for the rescue mechanisms, there are corporate voluntary arrangements and the judicial management, you may find them under Division 8, Subdivision 1 and Subdivision 2 respectively, also in Part 3. Let us now look at the two corporate rescues introduced in Companies Act 2016. Just as a reminder, Rescue mechanism aims at rehabilitating the financial and business viabilities rather than winding up the distressed company. So instead of going bankrupt, these rescue mechanisms help companies to reorganize their debts and financial condition to enable them moving forward. Under the Corporate Voluntary Arrangements or CVA, company directors or management will draw up a debt restructuring plan which is assessed by an independent insolvency practitioner. Specifically, this arrangement will be between insolvent limited company and its creditors and is subject to court approval. In this arrangement, the company will be allowed to repay an agreed portions of the debts over a period of one to five years. So this shows that perhaps the arrangement will try to find a way for debtors to pay less for creditors to at least get a portion of its debt back. However, for the arrangement to be approved, at least 75% in value, not in numbers, of the creditors must agree to the proposed terms. In practice, separate meetings for various classes of creditors, for example, secured, unsecured and preferential, have to be called especially when the rights of each class under the arrangement differ widely. But for CVA, the meeting of creditors will be involving only the unsecured creditors. The company also need to seek the approval of a simple majority of shareholders. This is mainly because CVA is only allowed for companies that do not create a charge of its property, either fixed or floating. CVA can be applied by members of the company or its creditors. They need to appoint nominee or otherwise the court will appoint a nominee to manage the agreement. That should be either a licensed insolvency practitioner, a judicial manager or a liquidator. For this scheme, they will need to choose creditors and members to be included in the scheme. Now, the main objective of this scheme is to provide a mechanism to effect a formal compromise to bind dissenting creditors so long as a statutory majority of votes has been achieved. Dissenting creditors are financial creditors who voted against the resolution plan or abstained from voting for the resolution plan, approved by the committee of creditors. This is the group of creditors it must tackle for the scheme to work. The second rescue mechanism is the Judicial Management or JM. Under this arrangement, the shareholders, directors or creditors of the company may apply to the court to place the management of the company in the hands of an independent insolvency practitioner known as Judicial Manager. In other words, the Judicial Manager 
will actually take over the management. So this arrangement is also known as involuntary reorganization since it is not the management that apply for the reorganizations of the company. The judicial manager is required to prepare and present a restructuring plan to creditors to seek their approval. The plan must be prepared within a 180 days moratorium that shields the company from being wound up. The plan must also be presented within 60 days from the judicial manager's appointment date. And upon approval, the judicial manager also need to oversee the implementation of the plan. Again, for the plan to be implemented, it needs approval of 75% in value of creditors. If agreement and approvals achieved and the implementation was successful, judicial manager will be discharged. If approvals are not obtained, the plan cannot be implemented and thus the company will go back to square one where it may eventually be required to wind up or liquidate. If the approvals obtained but the plan failed to be implemented as agreed, both arrangements can be ended prematurely. For further details of these schemes, you may refer the specific parts and divisions in the Act. Now that we have looked at the rescue mechanisms, we will next be talking about how we value businesses, which also related to the valuations of shares. In the second part of the whole topic on insolvency and restructuring, we will discuss about why we need or want to value our businesses and how do you go about that? So please have a read about them, okay? That's it for now. Thank you very much for your attention and I see you in the next video. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.